Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. Can you stand with me? Let's pray and get into the word for a little bit, and then we're going to see what the Holy Spirit wants to do tonight. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to open the word of God and for the opportunity for us as a people to study to show ourselves approved. Workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, let us rightly divide the word tonight, Father. Faith comes by hearing, and I thank you that faith will rise in our hearts as we meditate upon these things and ponder these things of our Lord. Tonight, Lord, we ask that our hearts would be filled with meekness, that we would receive with meekness the engrafted word which has the power to change our souls. Help us not to wander tonight. I know it's Sunday night. I know we can get weary I know we can be thinking about the the week ahead of us. So, God, I just ask tonight that you'd help us arrest our wandering thoughts and focus in on what you want to say and what you want to do. Now, Lord, we bless the churches around us. Whoever's having a Sunday night, God bless them. They're part of us, and we're part of them. We ask now, Holy Spirit, that you would come and teach, for you are the revelator of the church. And we ask it in the name of our King. His name is Jesus, and we thank you for him with all of our lives. Amen and amen. If you've got your Bibles, I want you, we're going to be in the book of Mark. We're going to be in 1 Timothy for the next few moments, minutes. You know, we, we live in a world that is busy and a world that is filled with media and distraction. We live in a world that constantly comes at us in a lot of different types of ways. We now have smartphones. We can now take notes and read our Bibles on our phones. And we can also text So I just hope and I pray that you put those phones away if you're not going to be reading your Bible or taking notes. Because I believe with all my heart that God wants to do something, but I believe the church has to get serious about what he wants to do. And he's not this great grandfather in the sky that just wants to pat us on the back and it's not kissy face and huggy bear and feeling good. This is about our Christianity, and this is about our future, and this is about our children and our children's children. It's about our nation. It's about our planet. It's about the plan of God. And I believe that we are coming into days and seasons and times. There are things going to be coming at us, coming down through that pipe that we've never seen before and we've not experienced before. And I believe that God warns his people and he teaches his people and he stirs up his people Because we are his body on the earth. And if there's one thing I think that if I could say after 25 years of pastoring with Jim, if I could say there's there's maybe one thing that to me seems to loom as 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 the major hiccup in our our getting God in the kingdom, it's that we feel detached from a living God who loves us. And I don't believe yet that we have the revelation of this joined fusion between God and us. I think sometimes we have a tendency to think that we're here and he's there. Instead of realizing that we are with him, seated in heavenly places, and he is with us on this earth, walking in us and walking through us to bring the kingdom. And so the Word of God teaches very clearly that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So when we open the book and we begin to hear the preaching of the gospel and we begin to hear the revelations of the Holy Spirit, we begin to study for ourselves, that Word has the power to bring itself to pass and it begins to come on and grab a hold of our human spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit that is fused with him. And it begins to teach us and it begins to give us imaginations that we've never been capable of having before. And before you know it, we start being transformed. And we begin to believe more and more. We begin to be changed from glory to glory. But there's a danger of in that process of being hindered and stopped by familiarity, and we're going to look at that tonight. So I want to look at Jesus, and it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I want to look at verse number 4. The name of this message is what happens when Jesus shows up. What happens when Jesus shows up? Like I said, everything changes. Everything changes. Because it says 
In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 4, who desires, speaking of God, I'm going to go to verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, speaking about praying and standing in the gap as intercessors for our land. It says, who desires, speaking of God, all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, my Bible says who desires all men to be saved. It doesn't say some men. It doesn't say, doesn't say some nations, some tribes, some religious communities. It says all men. Does your Bible say all men? That means everyone on this planet, it is God's will and it is God's desire that they be saved. Now, I don't know about you, but there was a time when that really stirred me up. But there was also a time when I got very, very, very complacent about that statement. So you can be stirred up or you can be complacent. Maybe it's time to identify yourself where you're at and ask yourself and check yourself tonight. Am I stirred up by that? Or am I just, is this just normal Christianity and I've read it a million times? I don't know about you, but Egypt is about to go under. If Egypt goes under, there goes Israel. The Middle East is in turmoil. I'm from the generation that's heard it all. We were raised up in Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. So it's been old hat for us to hear about the coming of the Lord. And it's very easy to say, I've heard that before, and he hasn't come yet, so why should he come now? Come on, somebody. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Who desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now, does your Bible say the man Christ Jesus? The man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. What I want to say is that right here we identify Jesus as the mediator. One mediator. One God, one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. A mediator is an intercessor. A mediator is one that goes between. A mediator is one who reconciles two opposing parties. What's interesting is that here Paul is describing him as the mediator. We see in Hebrews that he's the high priest, the author and the finisher of our faith. And a priest, a high priest, is one who represents God to man and one who represents man to God. So Jesus represents God to us. And he represents us to God. He's the mediator. But what I want you to see here is it says the man Christ Jesus. The man. And when I said to you that oftentimes you and I can feel very disconnected because we live in a world of taste and touch and sound and feel. And because we can't taste, touch, hear, and feel him with our physical senses, sometimes it can feel like he's up there and we're down here. But it says that he represents God to us, and he represents us to God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Now, if you're born of the Spirit of God, he's talking to you, and he's talking about you. If you have said yes to Jesus, he is your Lord and your Savior, then by one offering, he's perfected forever your life. You are not perfect right now. You are under construction, as am I. You're going to mess up, as I do. But you and I are now taken out of the kingdom of darkness, and we are now brought into the kingdom of God, and there is a major work going on as we walk out these earth years, and we are being perfected and being changed into the image and the likeness of Jesus. Because as he is in this world, so are we, according to John. Now, here's what I want to look at. He became man. And he didn't change. He will forever be the man, Christ Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father. Forever. He is all God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning. He created all things. All things were created by him. All things were created through him, and all things were created for him. He's the living word, the logos, the creator. 
It says by the breath of his mouth that he breathed out the constellations and the galaxies. The star breather, God, Jehovah, Lord, Jesus, became a man for you and me. Now, I don't know about you, but if you could wrap your mind around that, you're doing better than I can. What is it that God would do for us like that? Now, I read this in Christ the King in my class at the, co at the college. Maybe you've heard me read this, but listen, because you've got to listen to get this. This comes out of a quote from the glory of Christ by Peter Lewis. Hear what he says. Having become man, God the Son will never cease to be man. Even in heaven and through all eternity, he will be God in the flesh, albeit glorified flesh. The humanity that he has assumed on earth, he has taken to heaven. There is no longer a penalized, suffering humanity, but a human body irradiated with the glory of God. The eternal Logos will forever know in himself the joy of the redeemed as well as the triumph of the Redeemer. He will live forever in his two natures. The implications of this for our planet and for its people are enormous. It means that there is a human being on the throne of the universe. In the place of supreme and central significance for all creation, there is a man. In a place of supreme and central significance for all creation, all creation, there is a man. A member of and the head of the human race. Science has taught us something of the vastness of the created universe, but because of its alienation from God and its consequent deficient understanding of humankind as it should be, our society has felt shrunken and lost and insignificant in a vast cosmos. But it is in the teaching and life and redeeming work of Jesus Christ that we have discovered reconciled man's true significance and real destiny. It was not into an angelic race that God was born, but into the people of this inconspicuous planet. It is not an angelic nature that he now inhabits and lives through at the Father's right hand, but a human one. Go to the spiritual heart of this created universe, and there you will find a man. Go to the place where angels bow who never fell, and you'll find a man. Go to the very center of the manifested glory of the invisible God, and you will find a man, a true human nature, one of your own race, mediating the glory of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the only begotten of the Father, John wrote. We've handled him. We've touched him. We watched him die, and we watched him raise from the dead. We saw him stop the storms, the creator. We watched him heal where there was no possibility of healing. We experienced his demonstration of the kingdom of heaven day in and day out as we walked with him and as he showed us the Father and taught us of heaven, Jesus, the man. Church, two natures fused together, all God and all man. Because if he is not man, he did not qualify to be the last Adam to be our sacrifice. And therefore, we are lost in our sins. And if he was not all God, God in the flesh, first and last, alpha and omega, beginning and end, then he had no power to take up his life and to lay it down. And there was no life in his blood if he was not God. But praise unto the Lord God Almighty. He was all God. 
He was all man. He fused himself together with this divine nature. He became a new man, one that had never been the last Adam. And he came to redeem and reconcile and restore mankind and humanity to where we were supposed to be. But until you and I believe it and until we begin to step into it, it's just a nice Christian religion that keeps us all sane and not rude. And we become a social club instead of an absolutely turned inside out living body on the earth that is the church of the living God that believes for the miracle working power of God and the changing of the kingdom of heaven coming into earth and impacting our world like it did when he demonstrated it when he walked the earth. Now if that's true then you and I are out for the right of our lives and the best years ahead of us as we begin to believe God for this kingdom. So looking at Jesus, what's my point? He will now never cease from being a man. Jesus has completely identified himself with humanity. You are not alone and I am not alone. He's not up there and I'm down here. He has sent the Holy Spirit as the seal of redemption. He's put a ring on my finger. I cry out, Abba, which means Daddy, Father. I've been adopted into the family. I am part of the church of the living God, which Paul writes to Timothy and says, the church of God is the pillar and ground of the truth. Paul wrote in Ephesians that we are his body and he is our head and he has put all things under his feet, which is the church, which means we have now been given the delegated authority by our king who has absolutely taken the keys of death and hell and defeated Satan. And now he's handed us the keys of the kingdom. And now he says, I want you to go and be just like me. He came to show us what God was like. And he became a man so that you and I could become fused with deity and become sons and daughters of God. I'm not saying we're God, but I am saying I'm joined together with him. I am a joint heir of salvation. He is my head. I am a part of his great body on this earth. And what he did on this planet, how he brought the kingdom and how he brought healing and deliverance, and miracles, and the good news, and the gospel, and all that came with him, he has now given that over to me and you, and he's handed it to our generation, and it is our watch, and we are on duty, and we are his church in the Inland Empire right now in San Bernardino. The great exchange of deity fused with humanity has wrought humanity fused with deity to those who believe on his name. John 14, 12 says, most assuredly I say to you, the works that I do, he will do also. Greater works than these you will do because I go to my father. He's seated at the right hand of the father and he has given us his authority. So let's just look at some things quickly before we go into prayer tonight. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He didn't become an angel. He didn't rescue angels. He rescued us. We found that and we studied that in Hebrews, the second chapter. It was fitting for him who was going to be our high priest to understand fallen humanity. He never fell. He never sinned. But he understood us and he understood the temptations. God had never wrapped himself in flesh before. He didn't know what it was like. Now he knows, and now he stands as intercessor in the highest seat of heaven, and he ever lives to make intercession for you and I. He's praying for us right now. When you think nobody's praying for you, you don't have to despair because he's praying for you. I don't need somebody in heaven praying for me besides Jesus. I got the one that I need praying for me. He's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. So what did he do? He brought some things to us. He brought the gospel. Now, the word gospel means good news. When he was born, the angels came to those shepherds and said, Behold, we bring you tidings of great joy, which will be to all men. For unto you was born in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. In other words, the, the proclamation of God becoming man, that baby in that manger was good news. The gospel means good news. 
Now let me give it to you in five easy steps. What is this good news? It's God's creation, Satan's deception, Jesus' substitution, man's reconciliation, and complete restoration of all things. That's the good news. Let me say it again. I got this from T.L. Osborne. I didn't make this up on my own. I can give you the gospel in five easy steps. What's the good news? God's creation. He made us in his image. Satan's deception. He came and deceived mankind. We bit the bait. We fell and turned this planet over at the dominion of darkness. Satan's deception. Oh, but there was a plan of redemption from before the foundation of the world. It was called Jesus' substitution. For him to be the kinsman redeemer, he had to be close blood. He had to have the wealth to be able to buy us back, and he had to be willing. That's what a kinsman redeemer is, the Goyal. So that's why he had to be human. He had to have the resources of heaven. He had to be all God, and he had to be willing, and he was. Jesus' substitution. Man's reconciliation, when you and I believe on him, we are snatched out of that dark kingdom. We are brought into the kingdom of God. We are born of the spirit of God. The spirit of God comes to indwell us. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the last step, we are now a part of the great universal restoration process that is going on through the church and through Jesus Christ. He came to teach us the truth because we didn't know God. And, you know, it's amazing how men just love and mankind loves to just put God in this box. This is how God is. I don't know why it is, but we seem to do good with religious rule. Give me a rule and I'll be okay. I'll probably break it because I'm one of those rebellious ones. So if you're disciplined, you love rules and you can really keep them. But all of us rebellious ones and sinners, that was me, we're going to just say it's too hard, forget it, I ain't doing it. But you see, he didn't come to give us rules. He came to give us the kingdom. He came to show us the Father. He came to reveal to us in this material, corporeal world that is made of substance, natural substance, earth, dirt. He came to show us and give us a peek and a glimpse into the invisible world that far outstretches this one and that created this one. He showed us the Father. So what does it say? The truth. I just want to give some truth, truths to you tonight. Are you all right with me before we pray? Well, what are some things that I thought it was important for us to be reminded of tonight? The truths that he told us. Not just of the kingdom. So now go with me to the book of Mark. You've got just a few more minutes. In the book of Mark, Mark just dives right into his life. He doesn't go into the incarnation. He just goes right into the ministry of Jesus. It's a great book to read. I recommend you do it this week. Jesus begins his ministry in Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel, the good news, God's creation, Satan's deception, Jesus' substitution man's reconciliation, the universe restoration, the gospel. And then he goes on to begin to teach us these truths. And the truth, one of the truths that I want you to look at tonight is in Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. In Mark chapter 2, verse 27, Jesus makes a statement and he says, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Now, what is that, that going to teach me? It's about to teach you something and me something, that God loves man. And God didn't make these rules for us to put him in a box. What's happening here is his disciples are hungry and it's the Sabbath. It's Saturday, the Sabbath. And they're walking through the grain fields, and they're picking the grain, and they're eating it. And the Pharisees, who were the, the religious leaders who had taken the law and had, had taken it and put so many traditions on it that it had locked up Israel in legalism, the Pharisees are watching his disciples. And they come to Jesus, and they say, why are your disciples working on the Sabbath? Because they said, because they picked off 
the grain to eat it that they were actually harvesting. And Jesus looks at them and he just shakes his head and he says, listen, don't you know what David did when his men were hungry? How they went to Abathar, the high priest, the priest, and they went to him and they ate of the showbread, which was not legal. In other words, David's men, back in the Old Testament Pharisees, they ate what they shouldn't be eating. Here are my men picking grain because they're hungry, and you're telling me that we're working on the Sabbath? You've taken the commandments of God, and you've locked people into this religious box that absolutely squeezes the life right out of us, and you've missed the whole intent of the law. That's what he's saying. You've missed it. He says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. In other words, God didn't make man for the Sabbath because the Pharisees taught that man was made to worship God on the Sabbath and God needed the Sabbath so men would have to worship him. Jesus said, you've missed the whole thing. You care more about the law than you do about the intent and people. God made the Sabbath for men. Because God knew that men would be worked and worked and worked in this fallen world. And if there was not a day appointed for them to rest, they would never have rest. Their wives would not rest. Their beasts would not rest. So you've taken the intent of goodness and rest and worship, and you've tied people up into this religious box of what they can and they can't do on this certain day. The Pharisee said, you can't even spit on the Sabbath because that's like plowing. Your spit might move dirt. You see, you and I don't understand the, the, the year that they lived and the culture that they lived in. Religious people. Sabbath laws had become more important than Sabbath rest. They laid aside the commandments of God for the commandments of men. Mark 7 says, and he says this to me, and he says in this, Mark 7, and in vain they worship me, God says, teaching as doctrine. The commandments of men. Now, here he comes teaching this, displaying all of it, coloring outside the lines. Oh, I can't believe you did that. You're in church, coloring outside the lines. What else did he teach? So he, he, he taught us. He's beginning to bring in the concept that, hey, God's for you. He's not against you. He loves you more than you can imagine. And he didn't make you for the Sabbath. He made the Sabbath for you. Then he goes on. And how about this one? He taught us that no man is untouchable. No man is beyond the touch of the love of God. No man, no woman, no child is beyond the touch of the miraculous. No one. Mark chapter 1, just flip the page back. A leper came unto him in verse 40, imploring him, kneeling down, saying, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I'm willing to be cleansed. The law said you cannot touch a leper. Here was the law incarnate, and he said, I'm willing to be cleansed. He touched the untouchable, and he brought healing where there was no possibility of a touch. What does he teach me in that? That there is no one on this planet. There is no disease. There is no sin so vile. There is no person that is beyond the touch of the love of God and the healing power of God. What else did he teach you? He taught me and he taught you that man is valuable above all else. The value of mankind exceeds everything on this planet. And you see, when you and I don't value ourselves, we don't value anybody else. And we can so carelessly invoke cursings over each other. God says, don't you know that salt water and fresh water cannot come out of the same spring? Death and life are in the power of your tongue. You will guilty of judgment if you even say fool. Why? Because he knows the price that was paid for humanity determines the value that he places on humanity. And it cost him everything. And he reveals that to us when he goes to Gadara. And he begins to minister to one man who had a legion of 6,000 demons on the inside of him. He was in a graveyard cutting himself. No one could go through that graveyard. No one could get near that man. I don't know about you, but I think if you had 6,000 thousand demons in you, you'd probably be pretty supernaturally strong. What do you think? Probably? Because demons have to have a host. 
They can't just show up on the planet. They need to be in a material, corporeal form to manifest. Are you, you understand that? So here they were. They had invested themselves in this man. He, he goes all the way across the Galilee for one man. And in Mark chapter 5, verse 17, as he casts out the demons out of this wild, crazy man that was naked and cutting himself, the city comes in, and, and these demons said, oh, please don't send us to the abyss. And he said, they said, please let us go into the pigs. And Jesus said, go. And there's about 2,000 pigs, and 6,000 devils went into 2,000 pigs. They take off running, and they drown themselves in the sea because pigs have more sense than humans. <laughs> so when the city gets a hold of it, and they find out that he's here, they come running, the pigs are all gone. They're dead. So whoever owned those pigs, they have, they're out a lot of money. That's a lot of pigs, and that's a lot of profit. And they see the men of Gadara, and they see him sitting down in his right mind and clothed. So they see a miracle right in front of them. And this is what they say, and I want you to see this. Mark 5, 17. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. They began to plead with him. They didn't want him to stay they didn't want his power. They didn't want the message that man is more important than things and people and, and animals and business. They pleaded with him to leave because they didn't see the value in the man that had demons. And the man that had demons in verse 18, and when he got into the boat, speaking of Jesus, he who had been demon-possessed begged that he might be with him. So there's a community pleading for him to go, and there's one that's been set free that's begging to go with him. You see, that teaches me something. It teaches me what God's value is. God's value is on humanity, not on my business, not on the money, not on budgets, not on things, but God's value is on people. There is no one that is untouchable because the lepers were the worst of the worst. And if you had leprosy, you were consigned to death and a lonely death with nothing but lepers around you. You had to leave your family and everything. It changes that in an instant. There is no demons that can hold back a human being who wants to be set free. He showed that with the, with the man of Dara. I'm almost done. You all right? Now we're going to pray. He, spent his, he sent his spirit to be our guarantee. He gave us an everlasting inheritance. He secured all the promises of God, yes and amen, for you and I. All the promises of God, every covenant blessing, he has sealed in his blood. It is wrapped in his blood. He's given the church the keys to the kingdom. He's given us his authority. He has delegated his authority to you and I. He said, because I go, because all heaven and earth now belongs to me. I have the keys of the kingdom. Go ye, therefore, into all the world and preach this gospel to every creature. Preach it to every nation. These signs will follow them that believe. In my name, they'll cast out demons. In my name, you'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. In my name, if you have any deadly thing that's coming at you, it won't destroy you. In my name, you'll speak with new tongues. In my name, you'll bring the kingdom to this earth. Because I am the head, but you are my body. And I'm giving you delegated authority. I'm not asking you to huff and puff. I'm simply asking you to believe and do just what I have done. That's it. Believe and do. Believe and do. Believe and do. So church, I think that we've got quite an adventure ahead of us in these next 25 years. For however long I'm part of this adventure, whatever years I have left, there's a city to be won. There is a new generation that has not heard the gospel, and how are they going to hear if you don't speak it? There are the sick that need to be healed. Just because I live with doctors and nurses and great hospitals everywhere, listen, doctors and nurses are not of the devil. They are of God. Thank God for doctors and nurses. They keep most of us alive. But what if I told you 
that God wants the church to step into the miraculous and believe him for healing. Believe him for the supernatural. And how can we if we don't know it and if we don't begin to practice it and we begin to do it? So let me just review just a little bit. If God is for us, who's going to be against us? There's a man seated at the right hand of the Father. There are some warnings. There are some definite warnings that he gave us. And that's for another time. But right now, I just wanted to tell you tonight about Jesus. He came preaching and teaching the kingdom of God, bringing the gospel, the good news. The deaf hear, the blind see, the lame walk, the poor have the good news preached to them. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's you and that's me. Because the only Jesus this world is going to see now is through you and through me. So I believe God wants us to start believing. I believe God wants us to shake ourselves if we've been asleep, if we've gotten too familiar with the presence of God in church, if it's become a routine to us and common, if we've stopped inviting people and witnessing, being alive with the effervescence of the miraculous. I mean, when you know anything's possible and anything can happen with Jesus, then you know what? Life is really quite an adventure because what you can't do, like Pastor Luke preached this morning, is actually putting you in a really good place because now what you can't do, he can. He's not looking for talent. He's looking for people who will believe. So tonight, how many of you in here need the miraculous? How many are, 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 are here tonight? I just want the team to come back up. I'd just like to, to know how many of you in here you're sick in your body, and yeah, you've gone to a doctor, but you know what? The doctor's doing what he can, but you really need a touch from God. I just want you to, to just stand up. That's you. You need a touch, a healing touch. I know I do. I need a healing touch. I went to the doctor, and they said, my bones are diminishing. And, I, you know, I have a promise of God that says I'll be fresh and flourishing in my old age. So I, I need God to, I need to do what I'm supposed to do. But you know what? I can take a pill, I suppose, but they may work or may not work. But why, would, why don't I take a gospel? Why don't I take a healing pill? Psalm 107 verse 20 says, he sent his word and he healed them and he delivered them out of destruction. You know, you've been eating wrong, you've been doing wrong things, you got bad health because you have, you have poor habits. Well, you know what? Don't stand there condemned. You think those people didn't? God's beyond and goes beyond. His mercy goes beyond our mistakes. His mercy covers and his mercy extends love and grace and says, I will heal you. Whether you think you're touchable or not. Whether you deserve it or not, let's just get it in our minds. We don't deserve healing, but he gave it to us. So let's receive it. So if you're sick in your body tonight, I just want those that are standing around you. Now, look, we're the church. Now, we can't be embarrassed about this, okay? So we just need people to lay hands on us. So I want you to look around at who's standing, and I want you to just gently lay your hand on them. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. Mike and Sue, you can just lay hands on me. Because I want, I want, I'm believing for a miracle tonight. So, Father, I thank you for the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Father, that in that name, sickness and disease cannot stay in our bodies. So we take authority over every sickness, over every disease known to humanity. We curse you to your root and command that you be loosed and come out of us, come out of every believer in this room. We send the healing name of Jesus, the power of your word. He took our infirmities and he carried away our diseases. And we thank you, Father, for miracles and signs and wonders and healings. 
in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, now. We give you praise and we thank you for this amazing Savior that we have that loves us so much to heal our broken bodies. In Jesus' name, thank you. Amen. Some of us in here have habits, bad habits. And you get real disgusted with yourself and you don't like yourself. And you're discouraged with yourself tonight. That's not a bad thing, actually. That's a good thing because you're still hearing from the Holy Spirit and you haven't hardened your heart. Because when you no longer care, then you should be concerned. Because that means your hard heart has gotten calloused and you're no longer pricked by the convincings of the Holy Spirit that says, oh, you shouldn't have said that. Oh, you shouldn't have done that. He forgives us. But he says his first message out was the kingdom of heaven is, is at hand. Repent and believe. Repent means change. You say, well, I can't change. I've tried to change. Well, what's God's definition of grace at the rock? God's power, God's sovereign divine power. God's sovereign divine power on our behalf when we can't do it. Right? My definition that nobody remembers. God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. That's a whole different ball game. When I read something in the Word, and I am to do it, it's not a suggestion. Forgiveness is not a suggestion. Forgiveness is a commandment. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. That's not a suggestion. That's a commandment. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's not a suggestion. That's a commandment. Don't lie to each other. Don't steal. Don't fornicate. Don't have sex outside of marriage. And don't have sex with another partner if you're married. That's adultery. All kinds of sexual sin. All kinds of sin in our lives. All kinds of bad habits. All kinds of things. We go, oh, why did I do that? You hate yourself. Listen, tonight, tonight, God says he can help us. So I'm going to have us all stand up because I don't want to single you out. There isn't anybody in here that can't think of something in their lives. They need help changing. From Jim and I, to our children, to all the pastors on this staff, there is not one person in here that has been perfected to the stature of Jesus Christ yet. Not that I know of. We're on our way. So I'm not here to condemn us, but I am here to help us change. So, Father, I just thank you, Father, as we present these things to you tonight, that we believe for your grace your sovereign divine ability on our behalf, your power in us to do what your truth demands of us. For you are at work both to will and to do your good pleasure in us. So I thank you, Father, for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the ministry of grace by the Spirit of grace to our lives. And I thank you for responsive hearts that are not hard, but are tender, easily entreated, easily forgiving, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as you have forgiven us, Lord. And I pray, Father, for those that are struggling with habits that are dangerous and hurtful to them, Lord, that you would help them to change. Lord, you delivered me from smoking when I couldn't quit. You just made, you just made my body just get sick. I just started throwing up. Can you imagine, you can look up at me, this little testimony. Can you imagine a pastor's wife that smoked? There I am outside in the back with all of you just toking a joint. You know, I don't think that would work, do you? That probably wouldn't have worked. Jim wasn't a pastor when I married him. And we both drank, but we didn't smoke. I had stopped smoking by the time I met him. I smoked two packs a day. And I loved smoking. I loved it. So I'm not going to tell you that I, I just hated it. I didn't. But I lit a cigarette one day. I was coming back to the Lord, and I threw up everywhere. 
And then I thought, I must have the flu. Then I lit another one and I threw up. And then I lit another one and I threw up. And probably through the whole pack, I was sicker than a dog. And when I didn't smoke, I wasn't sick. So it finally, you know, I'm dumb blonde, you know, took, took a little while. Could this be you, God? Not knowing that I was about to make a move into a house ministry and I was about to meet a man we were about to go into the call of God. You see, God's grace, he knows where you're going. He knows what you need. So listen to your hearts when they're pricked. Apologize quickly. Even if that other one doesn't forgive you, that doesn't matter. You've done your part, and that's all you can do. But God wants to give you grace to make changes that you've not been able to make, and we just pray for that. Now I want to I pray tonight for those who have unsaved children. Where are you? family members that you love. It's the will of God that all men be saved. He says, where two or more agree is touching anything on this earth, it will be done for them. So let's take authority in Jesus' name. And let's pray for our families. I'm going to ask my husband to come up. I know he doesn't want to, and watch how stubborn he'll be in just a moment. But Jim, I need you up here tonight. I need your authority you're covering, and I need you to pray for the children and the families that are unsaved. Well, Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus. As a congregation and as a church, Lord, we lift our hearts to you. We say, Lord, there's family members, there's children that we have, and family members and aunts and uncles and parents and relatives, Father, that, that uh, may think they're okay, but don't even yet realize that they need to be right with God and need to be saved. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory. We lift their soul up to you, Lord. And we ask that they have a connection with the Holy Spirit, that you draw them home and that they truly get saved, go to heaven and not go to hell. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory, give you the honor. We stand on your word that it is your desire that every man be saved. And we're just praying and according to your word, you say that when we pray according to your word, you hear us, and Lord, you say that when you hear us, we have what we have. So we say, so be it, we agree. We say, amen, it's done, in Jesus' name. Thank you. It's the will of God that you be healed. It's the will of God that you prosper. It's the will of God that your families be healthy and whole. It's the will of God that you begin to step out and begin to believe God. You may pray for someone. The first time I ever prayed for somebody, I think they probably died. And I felt so bad. But you see, it's not dependent on me. It's dependent on him. He just said to do it. He'll take care of it. So what if you never did? I just had a testimony from a woman and girlfriends, and she came and she shared with me, and she said one night on a Friday night that my husband had stopped the service, and he was preaching out of Proverbs, and he said, there's a woman in here that has crippling migraines, and you've had them all your life, and God wants to heal you tonight. So if that's you, stand up. And there was, there was about 20 people that probably stood up, she said. She was one of them. She had never, ever not had migraines that she could remember. And if you've ever had one, it's like an ax is in your head and it's crippling because there's nowhere to escape the pain. It's in your, it's in your brain. It's actually a, a vessel. And my husband prayed the prayer of God that he told him to pray. And she said from that night on, she's never had another migraine. And that was 13 years ago. <laughs> now look, that may not seem like a big deal to you, but it was a big deal to her. Now, I didn't know that, and Jim didn't know that for 13 years. That, that miracle was hidden from us. So you don't know what happens when you pray. Somebody may not come running back to you and tell you what happened, but you pray anyway. And this week, you remember some things. Remember that, number one, that there's a man seated at the right hand of the Father that looks like you and understands you. He's your high priest. He represents you to God and God to you. 
Everything goes through him as our intercessor and our mediator. You don't need a man to mediate for you. You have the man Christ Jesus. You don't need saints to pray to. You don't need statues to pray to. You only need to pray in the name of Jesus, all that he is and all that he's done as his child, blood washed and Bible bought as the one that believes. And as you stand praying, ask him and believe. And God says, whatsoever things you pray and believe that you received them, you shall have them. Step out in faith this week. Remember that you are the church. You are his body on this earth. And just like he came preaching and teaching and bringing the kingdom, that's what he wants you to do this week. Wherever you go, and don't get weird in the workplace so you get fired. Do a good job in your jobs. Be the best employee you can be. Bring your Bible, but read it on your lunch hour. And wait for the opportunity to somebody to ask you, what is it about you? Why are you so happy today? Why? What's then in graciousness and truth, you begin to speak. Wait for the opportunities that are going to present themselves to you because they will. Now just have a seat because we're almost done. We're early tonight, so we have time, a little bit of time. We're going to go out and have some, I'm not telling you what we're going to have. <laughs> but I can tell you it has bacon. It has something to do with bacon. But I want to talk to you before we go. Because I don't know everybody in here. And I don't know if you are born of the Spirit of God, if you've been born again. And I need to, to give you an opportunity to extend an invitation to you to come and join and know him and love him as he knows and he loves you. you he brought you here tonight for no other reason than for you to come and hear this. You know, we don't like to talk about eternity because we're, we're here in the earth and we, don't, we can't see it. But the Bible says that he's put eternity in our hearts and that we're going to live forever. Yeah, we're going to separate from these bodies. You've seen a dead body. You've been to a funeral. You know when that spirit leaves that body, that body just lays there like a piece of clay because that's all it is. And it goes back to dust. But what, what happened to the person? What happened to that person that was in there? You see, they're eternal. They didn't just stop being. It's not a ceasing to exist when you die. It's just where you go because the word for death in, in biblical definitions is not a ceasing to exist. It is a separation. So when you and I die, we separate from these physical bodies. But where do we go? There's only two places. The Bible says that we'll either go to heaven, God's heaven, or we will spend eternity in hell, which he made for the devil, not for us. It was never God's intent for mankind to be punished and to live with Satan's fallen angels and Satan. Never. But we make the choice. You and I make the choice. God doesn't make the choice for us. We do. So my question is, when you close your eyes in death and your spirit leaves your body, where is it going to end up? In heaven or in hell? If you said, I hope it's going to end up in heaven, i got to talk to you because you can't hope your way into heaven. There's only one way to God's heaven. What makes you and I think we can get to God's heaven any other way but God's way? And God said, there's only one way to heaven. There's only one way. It's my way. And God says, you must be born again. Now, I don't care what America says. I don't care what the world religions say. That's not important because what's important is the truth that's in the word of God and what God says. And God says, there's only one way. That's why he paid such a price for you and I, himself, so that you and I would not have to spend eternity away from him. You've been away from him long enough, but there's only one way. And he says you must be born again. And what does that mean? That means in a very short sentence, born again means that my spirit is separated from God through the sin that I was born into. We are all sinners born into sin. Adam was the prototype of humanity, he sinned. He passed on that sin to every one of us. And Jesus is the last Adam. And just as Adam passed on the sin, Jesus came, all God and all man, to pay the price for you and I so that he hung on that cross and died for my sins. And if I'll look to that cross and I'll believe that he is a Savior, at that moment in time, he'll take me out of darkness and he'll bring me to the Father. 
but I've got to come through Jesus. There's no other way. What does that mean to come through Jesus? It means that I recognize, number one, that I am a sinner and I need a Savior. What does that mean? It means, number two, that I believe he is the Savior, the Son of God. I may not understand it, but I know it's true. And number three, that I surrender my life to him. Doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect. Doesn't mean I'm going to do everything right. But it does mean that I am going to let him be Lord and Savior of my life. And if you've never done that, and you're here tonight, and you need to, I want to give you the opportunity to do that. I don't want you to walk out those doors because you don't have tomorrow. You have tonight. And God brought you here specifically for this. So if you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life to him, I'm going to ask that you just lift your hand up all around us. And we normally count to three and we hit the table like this and I don't make much of a noise. And you say, I don't want to lift my hand up. I'll be embarrassed. Well, who cares? Who cares if we're going to be embarrassed? If we can't say yes to Jesus in this house, how can you walk out those doors to a hostile world and live for him? He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. Let's don't start off this new life by being afraid. Let's start it off with faith and say yes to Jesus. So if that's you and you need to get right with God all over this auditorium, I just want you to lift your hand right now. Just lift it up to me. Lift it high. Let me see the hands. I see that hand. I see that hand. I know there's more. Who needs to get right with God tonight? Look, we prayed for each other. We stood up. I see that hand. I've seen three hands right now. I know there's more. This isn't our normal altar call, but that's okay. That's all right, isn't it? You must be born again. Have you said yes to Jesus? Have you surrendered your heart and your life to him? Because if you haven't, God brought you here tonight. If you're wishing I would shut up, I'm really talking to you. Let's stand. If you raised your hand or you didn't and you should have, I just want you to come forward. We're going to just pray a prayer together. As we sing this song and you raised your hand or you didn't and you needed to and you should have, I want you to grab what you brought to church with you, slip out of the aisle and just join me right here. Let's get right with God tonight. Let's get right with God. Just come home. Come quickly and come home. You know, I can't make you come, and I'm not going to get in a religious tradition with you here. I'm just going to tell you that when I said yes to Jesus after I'd backslid for so many years, he changed my life, took me out of darkness from drugs and everything else. I'm an old woman now, but there was a time when I wasn't, and there was a time when I was a throwaway, and everything in the world had broken my heart, and I couldn't trust anybody but I could trust him. And you are not too bad for him. And you may not trust yourself, but you can trust him to get a hold of your heart like he did mine and change you from the inside out because you don't have the power to change you, but he does. But my goodness, he's not looking for cowards. He's looking for people that will love him because he's Jesus. And if you can't walk an aisle for him, then you're not worthy of it because that's what he says. If you put your hand to a plow and you look back, he told me, in the word of God, then you're not worthy of it. Pick up your cross, Debbie. Follow me wherever that cross leads you. See, Christianity is not for wimps. This is not a social club. This is about a God that spent everything he had to buy you and me back. And I'm not here to talk anybody into getting saved. He either is God or he's not. And if he is, then we better be afraid and we better start changing our lives and letting him be Lord and Savior and stop playing church. Now, I'm going to do this one more time. There were hands that went up. I cannot make you come, and I'm not going to make you come, and I'm not going to condemn you if you don't come. But I am going to ask 
this is real in your life, you need to step out of your seat and let Jesus be Lord and Savior in your life. So we're going to give you one more opportunity. We're going to sing this one more time. I'll let you. And I surrender. Okay, I want you to just grab somebody's hand right now. How many of you in here are born of the Spirit of God? Let me see your hands. Oh, I just told you to grab somebody's hand. So let it go and just raise your hand. Let me see. My husband's just giving me looks like, what are you doing now? Okay, if you are born of the Spirit of God, you know you're heaven bound. Raise your hand. Let me see it. Let me see. I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking. Okay, just about every hand's up in here. Now I want you to grab your neighbor's hand. Because we need people in this church that aren't saved. God said, with joy shall we drink from the wells of salvation. So we're going to take one more moment before we end this service. If nobody's going to come to an altar call, then I'm going to ask God for the lost of this city and my families and these cities of the Inland Empire to come into this house and get saved. Are you with me? Will you agree with me? Reach across and grab somebody's hand because we're in a divine agreement. We are now in a believer's meeting and we're going to ask God. So, Father, right now we stand as the body of Christ at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center on this July Sunday night. We thank you, Father, that we've had a great day. We thank you for the word that's getting forth. We thank you for, for Jesus that, Lord, that he is he's seated at your right hand. And, Lord, we look like him. He looks like us. We're part of the family of God. And you said we could ask. So we ask for the lost. We ask for the hearts and the souls of men and women that they would know Jesus, that they would come into the kingdom of God. Father, we ask that the fear of God would come upon our valley, that people would be respectful and afraid and want to know the living God. We ask, Almighty God, that you'd anoint us to preach this gospel wherever we go this week. That you'd anoint us to lead people to Jesus. That you'd anoint us to be testimonies and written epistles wherever we go. And may you confirm the word with signs, wonders, healings, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I pray over my people, Lord, over my family, that your anointing and your gifts would be upon them, Holy Spirit. That you'd lead them and you'd guide them. That you would bless them. That no weapon formed against them would prosper. Almighty God, that your favor would go before them. And Father, we decree as a family, out loud and on purpose, that the Inland Empire shall be saved. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.